The Apostle Paul reminds us that by nature we were children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Well, we're going to sing to begin our service this morning, number 187. Number 187 in our blue hymn books, O oh God, beyond all praising, we worship you today. as we sit let's join our hearts together in prayer let's pray we bow in your presence O oh God our God 
a God indeed beyond all praising because we can never begin to repay the love and the mercy and the generous joy that you've lavished upon us in Jesus Christ your Son. Blessings without number and mercies that truly are without end because of our Savior who has loved us and saved us and blessed us, not only in this life, but blessed us forever and ever. How we marvel, Lord, at your beauty and at your sheer bounty, which is directed towards us who believe your children. And we do want to offer you the praise and the love of our hearts. We want to bless you. We want to lift up our hearts to you and acknowledge to you as we acknowledge to the whole world the sheer joy that is ours in Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us, Lord, we pray that we might praise you as we ought to, ever just out of rote or mere religious duty, never reluctantly or grudgingly, never as though somehow in return we sought from you something that you might owe us, some debt that you should pay us. But rather, Lord, help us to praise you out of a joyful duty of delight in thanksgiving, in glad acclamation, doing what we must do and cannot but help do, telling forth the excellencies of you who has called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. So draw near us, Lord, we pray. As we seek your face this Lord's Day morning, come to us and help us. O God, whose never failing providence orders all things, both in heaven and on earth, we humbly beseech you to put away from us all harmful things and to give to us those things which will be profitable for us. We ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, a warm welcome indeed. Uh, if you are visiting with us, especially this morning, and particularly if it's your first time here, uh, we welcome you in the Lord's name and in the name of our fellowship uh, at the Tron Church. We'll have a chance to meet and greet you afterwards and uh, that you feel very much at home and at one with us here. You should have one of these uh, leaflets on your uh, seat somewhere. Um, less notices than usual just during the summer but one or two things to uh, mention do uh, look at the rest of the services today and if you're not involved at Queen's Park in the afternoon do come and join us again at 6.30 this evening as we meet here uh, to study God's word once again together on the back there you will see that uh, during the week this week we have our congregational prayer meeting uh, it is at 7.30, not at 7 o'clock, but um, some of you need to know that it's half an hour earlier than it actually is, so that wouldn't be a bad thing to come early, but do come for half past seven anyway, and uh, lots of people are on holiday, so more important than ever for those of us who are here to come and join in, in prayer for the Lord's work throughout the world. Release the word summer studies uh, for those students and young workers around during the summer, that meets on Thursday, and you'll see these various other things uh, still going on. Please note down at the bottom there, for the next two Sundays, there are uh, cycle races to do with the European Championships around the city, and that means lots of roads will be closed. You've probably seen some of the signs. So um, do look up the website. The details are there. Make sure that you know how you're going to get to church next Sunday, and uh, leave a little extra time to make sure that you can uh, do that. Do take note of that. Well, I'll leave you to, uh, to look at these notices and to use them, I hope, to help you in your prayers through the week for the different things going on in the church. We're going to turn now to our Bibles and to our reading this morning. Once again, we are in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. You'll find that, I think, on page 348, if you have one of our church Bibles. We're uh, spending a few weeks together in this single chapter of the Bible. We don't usually do that, but we're going to be... Uh, 
staying in this chapter a few weeks because it is one of the great chapters of the Bible, one of the great turning points, the, the great covenant with David. And as such, it illustrates for us some of the great truths that we find all the way through the Bible story, telling us uh, what kind of God it is that we know and we love and we worship. So we're going to read together again this chapter, beginning at First Chronicles and verse uh, 1 of chapter 17. Now when David lived in his house, David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, It is not you who will build me a house to dwell in, for I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up Israel to this day, but I have gone from tent to tent and from dwelling to dwelling. In all the places where I moved with all Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore... Thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a name like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. Violent men shall waste them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you, but I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And this was a small thing in your eyes, O God. You have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. And you've shown me future generations. O Lord God. And what more can David say to you for honoring your servant? For you know your servant. For your servant's sake, O Lord, and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness in making known all these great things. There is none like you, O Lord, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making for yourself a name for great and awesome things in driving out nations before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. And you made your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. And now, O Lord, let the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house be established forever and do as you have spoken. And your name will be established and magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray before you. And now, O Lord, you are God. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. For it is you, O Lord, who has blessed, and it is blessed forever. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. Well, we're going to sing together now number 772 in our blue hymn books. 
which speaks of the amazing grace of this who, who is also our God. Number 772. for the Lord's work we receive now. Musicians will play quietly and I'd like to read again this, this chapter we'll be looking at at the moment. Perhaps just to be uh, quietly in prayer. As we do that, our offerings are received.
pray together. Our God and our Father, we bow before you, the sovereign Lord of all worlds. And we thank you, Lord, that we can bring to you our prayers and our petitions, the concerns, the burdens of our hearts, not only for our own lives, but for your church and indeed for this whole world, a world so lost, so darkened, in rebellion against you, and yet even in its ignorance and in its animosity, a world so loved by you. And so, Lord, we ask for help as we, as Christian people, seek to pray as we ought to pray for all the great issues of our time and our day, bringing everything into your hands and to your throne of grace. We think of these dreadful wildfires that we've seen sweeping across different nations in recent days in Greece and now in California, terrifying scenes of horror and terror as people's lives have been taken as Numbers of people had to run, flee into the sea to save themselves from the burning. So many lives lost, so many livelihoods lost and laid waste as whole communities, villages, towns even, have been utterly destroyed. We think of this earthquake in Indonesia just in the last hours. And again, we see great devastation we pray to you, Lord, for succor and for help for all of those who have been so desperately hit in recent days <clears throat> amidst the aftermath and the shock and the turmoil. We pray that you would help those seeking to bring shelter to those who have been dispossessed, that you would comfort those who have been bereaved so tragically and so suddenly, and that you would help those who have suffered so much to be able to rebuild their lives and their communities and begin again to live in peace. But Lord, these apocalyptic scenes remind us all the more of the warnings of our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself said to us that in every one of these things that we see in this world are ears should be attuned to your warnings and our hearts should turn to thoughts of eternity and of the judgment to come knowing that one day as you have promised this whole world will see the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in clouds and with power and glory and there will be a final judgment when all this earth is salted with fire and when every human being who has ever lived will stand before you and all that we are will be laid bare before you our judge the one who alone decides our future so father we pray for the greatest need in this world today which is that your church in every part of this planet should be clear and strong, brave and committed in proclaiming the unchanging message of the gospel of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and who is to come, to proclaim him as the sure and certain judge of every man and to offer him, therefore, as the only Savior the only one who can save any from that coming conflagration which will make every earthly calamity seem as nothing on that great day. We pray, Lord, for your church in these places where there's been great devastation in recent days. We pray for your church the world over 
and ask that the gospel of Jesus Christ may be heralded, carried forth, spoken and heard, that the name of Jesus may be glorified and that his gospel may be believed and cherished. We think, Lord, of our own nation, so desperately in need of this message. We thank you for the many churches with whom we partner across the land, and we ask that, like us, you would challenge them constantly with your word and with your task, reminding them of the greatness of the gospel and calling them to be what you have called us all to be, servants of the word of God. We think especially of Grace Church in Dundee, facing a time of change and of vacancy with Mark and Joanne Ellis moving to Ireland now to work with the Christian unions throughout that island. We pray for the church there. We thank you for their ministry. We thank you for all the strengthening and growth that there's been in recent years. And we ask, Lord, that you would now guard them and guide them through this time of change. Be with Callum Jack as he, as interim moderator, leads them through this time. Be with all their leaders and all the people. And we ask, Lord, that soon we will be rejoicing with them in a new leader and pastor being appointed there, a man who loves you and serves you and will lead that church in the way of your calling for its future. We pray too for Edinburgh North Church and our dear friends Rupert and Jen Hunt-Taylor and all the fellowship there. We thank you for them and every remembrance of them. And we pray for Rupert as he spends these next few weeks still studying in the United States and ask that he would return refreshed and reinvigorated for the work there. We pray, Lord, for the many churches in our own city here with whom we partner and further afield in the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership. Pray for the church across the river there at Harper and in Greenview. We think of St. Silas across in the West End, of Bishop Briggs, Free Church, and many others, Lord, where there are those that we know and love laboring with us with the same gospel and the same task. Help us all, we pray, that we might be kept to this which is the great priority of making Jesus Christ known. And we pray too, Lord, this week very especially for so many from our fellowship away at the camp at Alton Creche under the leadership of Paul and Katie. Be with them, we pray, in all that they do this coming week. We do pray, Lord, for safety on roads as they travel in minibuses to different activities. Guard and keep them, we pray. But above all, Lord, we ask that in all that is said and in all that is seen by the young ones, in the lives of your people who are there to serve them and to love them, the message of the glorious grace of our Savior would be placarded unmistakably before their eyes and in their ears and into their hearts. We pray that many would see and hear and come to understand the gospel and love our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, to that end, we pray for ourselves this morning that you would open our ears and open our hearts too, that we might see and know you truly. For the God you really are, the God of all grace, who gives and gives and gives again. So hear us, we pray. For all that we ask is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, as we come to God's word then, we sing together the hymn on the screens now. <clears throat> in reverence and awe, we gather around your word.
Well, perhaps you'd turn with me uh, back to the chapter we read together in First Chronicles chapter 17, page 348, if you have one of the Church Visitors' Bibles. We're back again this week in this, uh, one of the great chapters of the Bible, and we're asking the question, what kind of God, what kind of God are we in the Christian church really talking about? What kind of God is the Bible really speaking about? Now, that is a very important question. It's a vital question. Whether you're somebody who is a Christian believer or, indeed, whether you're somebody who's a skeptic and uh, and an unbeliever. And maybe especially the latter, because if you want to reject God, if you want to choose to be an atheist, then at least you ought to be sure, oughtn't you, what it is that you're rejecting. That seems a fairly reasonable thing to say, doesn't it? But I I suspect that most people don't. I suspect that what many people are rejecting when they're thinking about God is not the God who is presented to us truly in the Christian scriptures. Maybe the God of other religions they're rejecting. Maybe the God of, of popular belief about what Christianity is. But it is not, in fact, the true God the Bible presents to us. So, for example, if your view of God and religion is like that of Napoleon, who said that religion is excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet, then, of course, your God is a tyrant. Your God is a tool of suppression. And then you'll want to reject him. You'll agree with Karl Marx, who says that the first requisite for happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. Well, I think probably most sensible people the world over today would say that the abolition of Karl Marx and his ideas has brought far more happiness and dispelled far more misery than the abolition of religion. Ask anybody living in one of the former Soviet republics. Look at uh, Zimbabwe today, where for the first time in 40 years, they're not voting for a Marxist, Robert Mugabe. I read even just the other week that in uh, Cuba, they're about to change the constitution so as to allow private property. So it seems that all over the world, people at least have realized that Marxism is not something that helps people, but something that devastates and destroys people. But there are still plenty of people, other than Karl Marx, who denigrate and damn religion. Richard Dawkins, probably today, is one of the most famous of those. Far worse than AIDS, far worse than mad cow's disease, Richard Dawkins says a cause can be made, a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils compared to the smallpox virus, but much harder to eradicate. It's interesting, isn't it, by the way, that Richard Dawkins uses the word evil there, but he won't allow an absolute God who will determine what good and evil should be. There's nobody so absolute these days as those who deny the absolute. It's ironic. But, you know, in our day of terrorism, where there's so much done around the world that is evil and that is done in the name of God, and of course, it's become fashionable, hasn't it, to lump all faith together as though it was all much the same thing. So that if it's liberal and in moderation, then it's all right. But if you have too much of it, if it gets too serious, if it gets anywhere towards the end that might be called fundamentalist, then, of course, it's dangerous, and it's all the same. Well, is that right? Is it just all the same? Is the main thing that nobody in their faith just gets too serious or possibly too fanatical? Well, if you don't have any real definition at all for that word, God, G-O-D, then, well, yes, that might be the case. All the more important then to see who the real God of the Bible actually is and how he is defined, indeed, how he actually defines himself and how different he is from all that so many people suppose God really to be, both inside the church and outside the church. So that's our task here in 1 Chronicles 17 for these few weeks. We're asking what kind of God is the covenant God whom the Bible reveals to us. And we saw last time that he is 
First of all, a God who proclaims. He's a speaking God who speaks clearly to human beings in language they can understand so that he can reveal himself to them. And there are two important things, remember. God speaks, first of all, so he can be found, so he can be known, so that real relationship can be established with him. That's the antithesis of all human religion, all rationality, all philosophy. God's not hidden. God is not leaving us in, in silence and with uncertainty and with mis mystery everywhere, so we have to seek for him. No, God reveals himself to us. God is the one who searches for us and finds us. And he shines his light into our human darkness and lights it up with the true knowledge of him so that we can know him. And second, God goes on speaking to us so that that relationship with him can be nurtured and continued so he can bless us as we walk with him. What a relief that is. We don't have to agonize and guess and wonder how to live. How can we live to please God? Are we living to please him? We don't have that crushing anxiety that so much religion has. Will God accept this offering or not? Is it enough? Do I need to do more? Now God speaks clearly. And we saw that in the first five verses with David the king. David wants to build a temple for the Lord, but God speaks to his prophet Nathan and says, go to David and tell him a better way. And that's always his way. In those days, God did speak through his prophets. But now, Peter says in his second letter to us, that we have as a Christian church both the words of the prophets of old and also the commands of our Lord and Savior through his apostles to guide us like a lamp in a dark place until the Lord Jesus comes. We, he says, have everything we need for life and godliness. We have something better than the word of God through the prophets. We live in these last days, as Hebrews 1 tells us, when God has spoken to the world ultimately in his Son. And so we now have a complete word from God because we live in this age of fulfillment. We don't live any longer in the age of promise. That's why the book of Hebrews repeatedly says that we have everything better. We have better promises. We have a better sacrifice. We have a better covenant because... The redemption in Jesus Christ is now complete. It's a finished work. Christ has come. He has died. He has risen. He has ascended. And God's revelation, God's word to man is all about the testimony to his redeeming work in Jesus Christ. And so obviously once that redemption is finished, then the scriptures are complete. God will never add anything to the finished work of Jesus Christ and his redemption. So we shouldn't expect him to add anything to his message about Jesus Christ. And that's why Peter says the scriptures are a sufficient word for us today. They are complete. They're not incomplete. They give us everything we need for life and godliness. In the words of the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles preserved for us. The Holy Spirit's work was not inadequate when he inspired the scriptures. He didn't leave anything out by mistake. He didn't leave anything out that he wanted us to know and that we need to know. Jesus promised his apostles in the upper room that he would come, the Spirit, and lead them into all truth so that they, the apostles of Jesus, would testify and bear witness to that truth in the world through what they speak and through what they have now written. So we as Christians today, we don't need to look anywhere else than the Bible. We don't need to have new revelations or special revelations so as to know how to live and what to do. That is impossible because we have all the divine words that ever we will need. To think that we need fresh revelations, fresh prophecies and so on today, that's to deny that the Holy Spirit is competent to give us the scriptures that we need. If we do that and look for that, we're saying the Bible is not sufficient, that it's not complete, that it needs complementing and supplementing. But no, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And that should be a great comfort to us as Christians today. God is not silent. He's not dumb. He's not disinterested in us. He's a God who proclaims himself to us in words that we can hear him and so that we can obey him. 
And for us who live on this side of the coming of Jesus, in this great age of fulfillment, when his work is complete, we have such a clear, complete, and better revelation, even, even than somebody like King David here in this chapter, who had his own personal prophet, Nathan. We have everything we need, says Paul, to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and to equip us for every good work. We have everything we need from a God who proclaims himself to us. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that we see in this chapter what God proclaims about himself to David. And he is, above all, a God who provides. That is, our God, the God of the Bible, is a generous giver, not a greedy taker from human beings. He's a God who provides for his people, not a God who creates creatures to provide for him. Now, do you see how the Christian scriptures turn every religion in this world absolutely on its head? That is the very antithesis of natural human religiosity. Human religion says, I must provide things for God. I must do things for him. Whether it's building temples for him, or making offerings to him, or doing religious duties for him, doing good things for him, or, as we've said in, in so many perverted minds today, or we must fight wars for him, or kill people for him, or blow people up for him, or blow ourselves up to kill people for him. If we do these things religiously, then God will look upon us with favor and bless us and give me the life perhaps that I want to live, answer my prayers. That's human religion in all its forms. And of course, it takes many, many forms, many cultural expressions. It might be part of an organized, recognized religious system, a world religion that we know. But it might equally be just a, a vague sense of spirituality. But in the end... They are all the same thing. This ancient culture in the Near East was superficially very different from us, David's time, but not fundamentally different. And in those days, it was expected that great kings, especially when they had won wars and conquered kingdoms, that they would come and build temples for their gods to say thank you. And that would then mean that their gods would bless them. If you go to at the city of Rome, you'll see ample evidence of that. One is the, the Arch of Titus, which uh, Caesar, after he sacked Jerusalem in AD 70, had made. And it depicts all of those scenes. That was part of, of the triumph of an emperor, dedicating these things to his gods. And so David, here he is, a great king and living in that world. And David, too, wants to build a great temple for his god. And that sort of thing still goes on. It's gone on all through history. It just takes different forms. Great men, especially when they come towards the end of their lives, they want to do great things, great legacies. The Bill Clinton Foundation and so on. Or think of the great uh, wealthy uh, uh, men of our day today, people like Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett and so on, setting up vast uh, foundations with billions of dollars to do great things all around the world. And indeed, they are doing some great things. Bill Gates has uh, devoted himself, I think, to eradicating malaria. And, uh, well, I certainly think that probably uh, he's much better able to spend billions of dollars wisely than most of the governments in the world. Don't you think? It's his money. And those are great things. But it rather looks like the same sort of thing, doesn't it? It's a, a quasi-religious act. And you can see that in so many different ways in the religious behavior of human beings. Think of all the pilgrimages that take place in so many different forms in different religions. Hindus going to the holy rivers like the Ganges and others. Muslims who uh, aspire at least once during their lifetime to make that great pilgrimage to Mecca to do the Hajj. Or Roman Catholics very often doing similar sorts of things, wanting to go to Lourdes or, uh, or places like that. It's the same in, in the sort of folk religion that we still have the vestiges of, the folk Christianity that we have really in, in our country today and other countries that people call Christian. The sort of thing where people want to do something for the church. I've been a loyal member of the Kirk all my life. I, I'm, I've been a pillar of the Kirk, so I, I want to have a plaque on the wall that'll help the church or something of that nature. All the same kind of thing 
It's all religion. It's building temples for God. And the unspoken thing often is that, well, surely God will look upon these things that I do and will bless me in return. But you see, God makes absolutely clear all through the Christian Bible that he is not that kind of God, not at all. I want you to see that so clearly just in this chapter. Look at verse 4 and look at verse 10 and see the extraordinary contrast that there is there. Verse 4. It is not you who will build a house for me to dwell in. And verse 10. I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. Isn't that staggering? That God is the initiator, that God is the builder, that God is the provider for David, not David the provider for God. The true God is a God who provides. It's not about what we can do for him. It's all about what he is doing for us, what he's been doing for us right from the very beginning of this story. See, what God says to David is that he's not nearly so interested in temples as buildings as he is in building a dynasty for David's line so that one day at last the son of David would rule forever in a kingdom of peace and of safety with all his people's enemies destroyed forever. That sounds like paradise, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does. That is what God is promising. Look at verse 9. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. That's the promise that, that God had given about his people right back from the very, very beginning of the story of the Bible, right back from the story of Abraham. You might want to turn with me right back to Genesis chapter 12 just so you can see so clearly in that chapter where God first gives that promise of a kingdom and a people and a place. God said to Abraham right at the very beginning, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's what Ralph Davis calls the quad promise of God. The four things. He promises Abraham progeny, a people, a family. He promises him a place of peace and safety. He promises him his own presence to protect him and guide them. And he says to him, it's not just for you and your little family. It's part of my plan for the whole wide world to bless all nations through you. That's what God has promised from the very beginning. That's what Moses sang about after God rescued his people Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. And they were on the way to the promised land. And in Exodus chapter 15, Moses said, Lord, you will plant them on your mountain, the place that you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, the temple, O Lord, which your hands have established. You see, it's God who provides the place and the sanctuary for his people, not the other way around. God who is building the temple that really matters. His own dwelling place, his house, to share with all those that he calls his people. And he's doing it all for the sake of his people. They're not doing it for him. Look in this chapter again, look in verse 6. He talks about judges who shepherd my people, his people Israel. Verse 7, David's to be a prince over my people Israel. Verse 9, again, it's a place for my people Israel that God promises. Again in verse 10, my people Israel and all through. Our God, the true God, is a God who provides for his people. He's the one who's building them a home. And it's a lasting home, an eternal home. With a God of your Bible, you see, it's not what we offer him, it's not what we do for him. It's not what we give to him. It's all about what he gives to us. 
The true God is a God who provides for his creatures, not a God who plunders from his creatures. The Christian writer and apologist was once asked, apparently, to give a simple answer as to what marks out Christianity from every other religion. And in a flash, he said, oh, that's easy. One word. Grace. Grace. That's the word that encapsulates everything I've been saying about this God who is the provider for his people. The amazing grace. That's the word at the very heart of the Christian gospel. And in this chapter, God is pressing that message home again and again into David's heart in the most vivid of ways by saying, I will be the one who builds a future for you. And the chronicler too who records it is, is pressing it home to his readers. That includes us. Now, why was he doing that? Was David some sort of a legalist? Did David not know what God was really like? Did David really think that he could, he could buy God's affections by doing his good works? Didn't he know that God was a God of grace and mercy that saved his people despite themselves, not because of what they were? Of course David knew that. David knew that far better than most of us. Just read his psalms. Just go back one page to chapter 16 here and, and read the extraordinary psalm of praise, which is all about God's goodness and grace and his mercy. David knew that. So, so why this emphasis on God's free, sovereign grace? And why is the chronicler restating it again to his people? Well, friends, I think it is because simply... The grace of God is one of the hardest things for human beings to really grasp, to really digest, to really understand, to really lay to heart and believe. Just because it is the very antithesis of everything that our religious self-justifying hearts want to believe. We want to believe that we have something to offer so that God should bless us. Even if we're believers, as David was. And so there's a constant drift, isn't there, in our hearts and in our minds towards, towards worshiping the wrong God, a God who is different from the true God. In our minds constantly, we're imbibing the false ideas that are all around us of what others think God really is. And so we start to think that what really does matter is what we do, how we perform, what we are building for God, not what he has built for us. And that's why we tend either towards pride and hypocrisy, if we think that we are doing well and wonderfully for God, or else towards despair and terrible guilt when we realize that we're not up to scratch. That's why one of the biggest problems for religious people is living with crippling guilt. People from a Roman Catholic background, for example, so often who have no assurance that their salvation is purely and simply and only ever from the grace of God. So often they live lives crippled by guilt, wondering if God really will accept them. But it's a problem for all of us even who know the true biblical faith, who do understand grace because we constantly are forgetting in our hearts that God really is the God of grace, the God who provides. And we constantly put those burdens on ourselves again and again. And those are burdens, friends, that we can never possibly truly bear. If that's never been a problem for you in your life, well, all I can say is praise the Lord. But it is a problem for nearly all of us. That's why the New Testament letters are repeating again and again, grace, grace, it's all by God's grace. Because you see, however correct your theology of grace may be in your head, however correct your intellectual grasp of the grace of God might be, that is not enough, it's not enough. It has to become personal gospel to you again and again and again, right deep down in your heart. It's no good just having a, a cold, rational knowledge of God's grace. The sense of that grace has to be on your heart, and it has to be stoked again and again and again, like a fire to keep it aflame. That's what the Bible means by the word remembering. 
constantly telling us to remember God's grace. But it's not because we've forgotten in our heads the gospel, is it? But it's because in our hearts we are constantly stopping believing it. We stop rejoicing in that experience of God's real liberating grace. And that's why we need constant reminders of what kind of God it is we really serve and know through Jesus Christ. He's this kind of God. He's the God who provides. He is the God of amazing grace. And if you don't keep that alive in your heart, then you will drift back into a kind of burdensome religiosity that enslaves so many people the world over today. Instead of the, the joyful, liberating service of a God who provides everything that we've ever needed and everything that we need in order that we can please him. And sometimes it's especially important for, for keen young believers who are spiritually alive like David. David, God says, has a right intention in his heart. You mean well, he tells him later on. But God had to, had to help David to see the bigger picture of what he was doing, to see what it was really about, how grace really is abounding to a lost world. It's not just a little temporal story. It's not just a story about you. This is an eternal story about blessing abundantly all God's people forever. Look at verse 14. That's what he says, isn't it? I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. This is an eternal story of God's grace. And then in verses 16 to 18, David clearly grasps that because he says, everything that you've done to me, O Lord, and for my family, I see now that's just a small thing. But you've shown me the future. You've opened up my eyes to just how great your grace really is. It's so easy, isn't it, to make God's story far, far too small so that it's all about me and my life and my relationship with God alone. When that happens, we become very focused on, on ourselves, on the present horizons, on our own personal horizons in life. And so naturally then everything becomes about, well, am I doing well or am I not doing well? Am I succeeding or am I failing? Am I doing evangelism as I ought to be? Am I praying enough? Am I having my quiet time? Is God pleased with what I'm doing? And so on and so on. It's easy then. But that's our horizon. To become burdened, to become miserable, to become joyless. Even King David could become all taken up with just what he was doing and what he ought to be doing for God. Should I be building a temple? Should I be doing this or that or whatever? And God's answer to David, by the way, is not, oh, lighten up, David, don't take me so seriously. <laughs> no, it's, it's the opposite of that, isn't it? He's saying, take God much more seriously. Look up, see how much bigger is the plan and purpose of God that you have been brought into and involved in. Grasp just how wonderfully he really is the God who provides everything. See the greatness of his story of grace. See what he is building today, not just for you and your little family, but for the whole world forever and ever. And the great king who is going to be their leader and their shepherd. Understand the scope of that grace. The gospel isn't just something to deliver us from our personal guilt, our personal sin, our personal lives, great as we need delivered from that. It delivers us, says the Lord, from the whole of this evil age and for a whole new creation in which we ourselves have been granted a great place. And it's when we understand that, you see, that we're truly liberated. And that's what David experienced here. It was a liberating experience for him to show him just how much greater God's plan and purpose was than ever he'd fully grasped, how much greater the gospel really is. You see, when that suddenly happens to you, well, you begin to get a true perspective on yourself and your own life and just how small our own personal issues really are, our own concerns compared to the greatness of God and the, the greatness of what he's doing in this world. 
Verse 16, David says, who am I? What is my house that you brought me thus far? Oh, this is such a small thing. It's so big in my eyes, but it's such a small thing. Because now you've shown me the future. And what can I say, he says. You've made known all these great things, these unparalleled things. And for who is like, verse 21, your people? The people redeemed by you, rescued by you, made yours forever and ever and ever. No, there's none like you, Lord. No God beside you. A God who provides, a God of extraordinary grace, who has redeemed the people to be his, not just for this time, but for all time, for eternity. David says, who am I to have a part in this? And that's what bowled him over. That's what humbled him. Humbled by the God of grace, the great provider. And friends, that's what we need to be bowled over by and humbled by again and again and again. That even all our Christian service, whatever it might be, however great it might be, it's such a small thing. Who am I in this extraordinary scheme of God's grace? And yet... By his extraordinary grace and provision, every one of us who names the name of Jesus has been granted a part in that great story, in what he is building forever and ever and ever. And he has provided all of this for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the great provider and the gracious provider. So the life of faith isn't just about, about you and me about what we are building for our life, about what we are doing for God. Thank God for that. It's not about our performance. It's all about God's great provision. It's about him, what he's provided for us. And David says in verse 23, let your word be, let it be, amen. That's the response, isn't it, of somebody who's understood the God of grace. I will build you a house. I will establish the kingdom of great David's greatest son forever. And he says, let it be so. That's our God. He's the giving God. He's the God of grace. He richly provides, even for us, an entrance into that marvelous everlasting kingdom of light the household of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad, if you're a Christian believer today, aren't you glad that you can rejoice that this God, the covenant God, the giving God, the God who provides, is the true God and is your God? If you're a follower of Jesus today, that is the God you worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the one who has spoken into the darkness of our world to reveal yourself to us as the very opposite of all that is in our hearts. Help us, we pray, to grasp not only in our minds, but also in our deepest hearts, in our emotions, in our feelings also, what it means that you are the one who provides us with everything we need for life and godliness and for everlasting life and godliness. Help us, we pray, to be people who love your grace and who proclaim that grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close some verses from hymn number 749. Oh, how the grace of God amazes me. It loosed me from my bonds and set me free. It's a very long hymn, so uh, we shall omit verses 4 and 5, but we sing the rest of number 749.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.